This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Hello again, I'm Marcy Green with the Chancellor at UC Santa Cruz. We'd like to take advantage of this intermission in our program to give you an opportunity to learn more about UC Santa Cruz. First, let me tell you about our mission statement. We pride ourselves on being a research university with an uncommon commitment to undergraduate education. That means here at UC Santa Cruz, not only do our graduate students and postdoctoral researchers have an opportunity to engage in research and discovery, but so do many, many of our undergraduate students. In addition to our mission statement, we also like to say that here at UC Santa Cruz, innovation is tradition. And so perhaps it shouldn't be such a surprise that the beginning of the Human Genome Project has its roots deeply embedded in UC Santa Cruz. In 1985, when we were barely beginning to develop the technology that would make it possible for us to sequence the human genome, there was a meeting held in which a very distinguished molecular biologist, Dr. Bob Sinsheimer, who was then the chancellor at UC Santa Cruz, began the discussions of how the Human Genome Project might evolve. Now, part of this is because UC Santa Cruz has been deeply involved in major scientific projects for a long time. And in 1985, our astronomers were in the process of building the world's largest telescopes, the big telescopes at the Keck Laboratories uh, at Mauna Kea. University of California at Santa Cruz is the host to the University of California observatories, which in fact are responsible for those telescopes on behalf of the University of California. So perhaps it was because of this major project already ongoing at UC Santa Cruz that Chancellor Sinsheimer thought it would be appropriate to begin discussions of a very large biological sciences project, a project that would unlock the secrets of the human genome, a project that would begin to help us understand the devastating human diseases, genetic diseases that, that harm so many families. In any case, whatever his motivation, a meeting started here in 1985. And at that meeting, not only was, were, were the scientists discussing whether or not such a project could in fact be done in the biological sciences, but they were also talking about the very important ethical and uh, other concerns that were raised by actually understanding and knowing what our genes might be telling us about our future. And so it is only appropriate that now that the human genome has been sequenced, that another meeting is held here at UC Santa Cruz to talk about the so-called post-genomic era. Now that we know the alphabet for the human genome, what is that alphabet really going to tell us about who we are, what diseases we're going to develop, how is it going to help scientists to engage in research, even stem cell research, research that can and probably will prevent diseases that we barely understand today, make it possible for people to not suffer from Parkinson's disease, prevent people from getting diabetes, et cetera. There's so much that can be done with the information from the human genome. So of course we here at UC Santa Cruz are not only proud to have this meeting here, but we're also excited for the scientific work that we conduct here on our own campus. You'll hear a bit more about that in our program as it continues. Well, of course, no one can uh, hope to uh, match Francis's ratio of uh, papers to uh, awards, but, <laughs> I, but broadcast to awards for me, I'm afraid, would be a, a, a number with the decimal point over a couple from there. But uh, uh, I'm really happy to be back here after 21 years. Uh, I've been back once or twice since, but uh, it, is, it is amazing had to come back and sort of feel a real homecoming, so I'm pleased to be here. Um, I'd like to start by uh, moving quickly into the question and answer period, but I wanted to, uh, I think we'll, uh, we will uh, skip the uh, 
uh, since Francis has already given a lovely opening speech, I think the rest of us uh, at, the, at the podium should have a chance to have a few words. I must say that Francis did feed me the perfect line uh, uh, during his talk, which is that uh, he had an emergency root canal yesterday, and, uh, and, and it, it is irresistible, although not original, to say that he did an excellent job of transcending dental, dental medication here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working on it. <laughs> well done. <clears throat> so anyway, <laughs> um, what I thought we'd do for the, for the next hour or so would be to ask each of the three other folks here on the panel to make a few words, say something provocative, uh, get, get our, uh, our questions flowing, and then I will take a little time to, um, to sort of moderate a discussion among the, among the five of us. Uh, I will sort of uh, ask some questions to individuals, and I hope people will speak out as a group as, as needed. And then uh, for the last half hour or so, we will be entertaining questions from the audience. Uh, don't get up until it's time, but there are microphones stashed in this room, and there's also one at the remote site uh, uh, up the hill a little bit. And uh, if technology is with us, we can also take some questions from up there. So anyway, uh, I thought I would start by... Uh, Introducing people singly, I guess, here, uh, Dr. Sinsheimer, Robert Sinsheimer, was the chancellor at Santa Cruz when I was at Santa Cruz uh, back in the mid, uh, I guess, in mid 70s to mid 80s, thereabouts, and uh, uh, has returned to the lab at UC Santa Barbara a bit and uh, just has tremendous uh, uh, sort of knowledge and, and feel for what has been going on over these many years. Not only uh, the meeting in 1985 that got all this started, but also, he was a participant at the Asilomar Conference in 1975, where uh, a lot of the really fundamental issues about genetic engineering were first raised in, a, in an organized fashion. So uh, he's a man who has clearly had a great deal of, of long-term thought about not only what, what the sciences is, but, but what it means for us as a society. So I'd first of all like to ask Dr. Sinsheimer to say a few words to us about uh, his reflections on, on what happened here uh, yesterday, and, uh, and, and you know, where, where you see things are going from here. Well, as the uh, convener of the, con the meeting that we had here in 1985, it was fascinating to participate in the discussion yesterday. In uh, 1985, there was a lot of debate about whether the human genome could possibly be sequenced, whether we had the technology to do it. Yesterday, there was more discussion about how could we do it for a lot less money, <laughs> not could it be done at all. Also, at that time, there was a lot of debate about whether it was wise to bring what was called big science into biology. And now, today, there's no question about it, and I think we realize that that is the scale on which we have to practice biology in order to approach some of the important questions that otherwise we can't deal with uh, one at a time. There were also, at that time, concerns about how this information would be used. We did have the medical implications in mind, and the, uh, Dr. Collins has given you an excellent exposition of the potential medical benefits. We also, as biologists, I think, had in mind that in addition to the human genome, once we knew how to do that, we would be able to do the genomes of many other organisms. And that would give us insight into the whole path of evolution and how it is that over four billion years life evolved to bring it to our current state. And that, of course, includes us. And that out of this information, then, will come a lot of insight into those particular qualities that are unique to humans and how they arose in a genetic sense and that that will give us a lot of uh, understanding of ourselves. Thank you. Uh, I will turn to my left now and uh, introduce Mary Claire King from the University of Washington. Uh, I guess I, f I first came across Mary Claire King uh, quite a number of years ago, maybe sh shortly after I graduated even, because uh, when she was at UC Berkeley, helping uh, figure out uh, the relationships of uh, the, some of the disappeared in Argentina using genetic techniques to, to understand the family relationships between uh, uh, families torn apart by horrible uh, civil 
activities in that in that country, and uh, she has. Uh, over the years, done uh, a lot of other stuff, including uh, uh, exploring uh, the what we in the press have loosely and not very correctly called the breast cancer gene, uh, and uh, and has dealt with some of the real deep issues of, of medical genetics, what how genes affect our health, health, and what we can do about that. So, at any rate, I wonder if you'd say a couple of words as well. Sure. We didn't get together beforehand to think about what we were going to say to you. We've all been thinking about it privately, so it's, for me, a, a, a privilege to be able to speak right after Dr. Zinsheimer. And his perspective to me is a treasured one. And I find it um, perhaps iconic of our field that much of what he says is the same thing I took away from the meeting yesterday. Now, bear in mind that the people meeting yesterday are highly technical people, all of whom work at the cutting edge of technology. And yet, what I took away from the meeting yesterday is that the way that we think about evolution and the way that we think about um, public health and medicine have converged and that the differences between these disciplines essentially will disappear over the next very little while, over the next year or so. That the same forces that we've known about since um, Darwin and his successors wrote about them that guide evolution, that is the introduction of new variation or mutation in the original generic sense of that term. Uh, selection for variants that are the most well adapted to a, to a specific environment. Migration of individuals within a species and the, the chance consequences of mating patterns and population structure of a species were now in a position to evaluate not only in terms of evolution of ourselves and, and other species, but also in terms of the reasons that some diseases are commoner than others, the reasons that diseases increase or decrease over time, the reasons that there are many different um, causes of common complex um, uh, disease traits in people and that we have the tools, both conceptually and in very practical terms at the level of sequence now, to be able to ask those questions. So for me, this, this meeting was in many ways uh, the beginning of the synthesis. Those of us in genetics, of course, have thought about the, the, the difference between Mendelian genetics and Darwinian genetics, between quantitative genetics and particulate genetics for the entire life of this very young field. And now that synthesis is made real, not only at the level of theory, but also at the level of practice. And I very much look forward to seeing how that's going to play out, both in, in the work of people of, of my cohort and also of the work of the next generation. Thanks. Uh, Jean Myers is uh, from the Solera Corporation uh, uh, in Rockville, Maryland, at, outside of Washington, D.C., and uh, is, is one of I'm sure this is a fair characterization, one of the, really the four prime movers of that really remarkable, amazing feat that was, that was pulled off by this private corporation to, to uh, figure out how to sequence the human genome uh, quickly, do it uh, with private funding, and, uh, and uh, not only did they succeed, but they also, I think, uh, helped jumpstart a little bit uh, uh, the, the public effort, get the public effort moving uh, faster, and, uh, and, and, and it was a a fascinating time to watch. Jean uh, is not what I would expect uh, to be. Uh, he's uh, uh, <laughs> a much nicer person. Considering, considering uh, we, we all grew up thinking of the genome as being uh, something in the, in the realm of, of biology, and I think that the, the, what Jean's contribution was, I, I think it's fair to say, is not, not, sort of not thinking about the biology of it, but thinking about this as a massive puzzle that needs uh, vast computational skills and, and really clever tricks for, uh, uh, for figuring out a way to, to make it all work. And I think it's, it's, it's a fascinating glimpse to me of, I, I sort of wonder if I had gone into biology, if I were just graduating now as opposed to 20 years ago, I imagine I would have been fascinated by that, that, that nexus between computers and biology because it is, and, and not just computers, but the, the whole way of thinking about how, uh, how to solve it, an enormous problem like this. So, at any rate, uh, he adds uh, interesting perspective to the panel for, for, those, for not only being in the, in the public private sector, I'm sorry, but also uh, as somebody who has uh, really thought about this problem in a, in a refreshing uh, and, and obviously very fruitful way. So please. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, 
So, um, you know, I think that, that in biology, actually, the experiment has always been the thing. I mean, it's been how you probe the cell to discover things about it that's been important and been the, the, the key to driving our, our advancement of knowledge. And, and really, that hasn't changed any. Um, you know, today, it's just that the experiments that we do are much more technology-oriented. I mean, sequencing involves a tremendous amount of technology and robotics uh, and techniques. And, um, um, you know, it's an age of technology. And with that technology, of course, there's always analysis and, and computers are an essential component. So it really is the case that as we go forward, um, um, biology is going to look different in the sense that people are going to have to be very technology and computer savvy as we go forward. Um, what what I'm very excited about is, is now that we have the sequence of the genome, um, we basically have um, the ability to generate the complete parts list, um, all of the actors that are in um, the cell, uh, all of the proteins and RNA molecules that are basically making a cell function. And um, I mean, in conception, what has to happen is fairly simple. You have to figure out how all of these actors interact with each other, and what kind, how, when are they meeting up with each other, what are they doing when they're meeting up? Are they, what, what molecules are they exchanging? What are, the, what are the roles that are taking place when they meet? And where are they doing it? And um, um, in conception, that's basically it. If we had all that information, we'd have a very complete understanding of a cell. Of course, that, while that sounds very simple, it's extremely difficult. The, the, the whole issue in a lot of the discussion yesterday was about what technologies can we employ or are ripe to move us in that direction. Um, the, the, I'm so excited about it personally that while I've been a computer scientist for the last 20 years, um, I'm going to basically call myself a biologist for the next 20 years because I think that that's where the action is, okay? Um, you know, I, I think that we really do. I, I, don't, I, I think that, that, that Francis's comments were on the, on the money in the sense that, that um, this is going to be really a very interesting century in terms of our ability to understand and manipulate life at the cellular level. Um, it's going to happen. Um, you, know, we, you know, we started out with computers that had vacuum tubes that you could walk through in, you know, in the early 1950s, and now we have, you know, handhelds that are just as powerful that we can link up to the web. And so there's been this wonderful renaissance in the last 40 years in computers in terms of that advancement. Well, think about that progression, and now think about it in terms of biology. That's what's going to happen in the next 50 years, and it's very clear, I think, to all of us that that's what's going to happen. Um, and so I think with that, I mean, so I'm, I'm so excited about that agenda that I want to, I, I want to know how life works. I mean, it, I think it's a fantastic question, and I think we're on the precipice of really beginning to get inroads in a significant way, in a really big way. Um, and so I think that Francis's question um, about what are we going to do with the powers that we are going to develop in the next 50 years is an extremely important question. There's tremendous promise. And there are, there are tremendous ethical issues, and I think, it's, I think it's very worth thinking about because we will have the ability um, to not only diagnose disease, but to, but to alter cells. And, and I think there's a very interesting question there. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to explore uh, the issues that all of you have raised at the, at the table, but I should also give uh, Francis Collins a chance to, uh, to, part, to, to, to join in here. So let, let me, I'd like to sort of open up our, our discussion among ourselves with a uh, more of a philosophical than a ethical, scientific, or ethical uh, legal question, which is thinking about whether the, the number of human genes, whether it's 30,000, 50,000, or even 100,000, uh, it's uh, hard to figure out how to go from there to really explaining a creature as complicated as we are. I mean, when you think of the number of connections between the neurons in our brains, I mean, we journalists have, have tended to call this the genetic blueprint, but clearly you can't have a blueprint that only has 30,000 lines if you're describing something that has uh, so many, you know, trillions of connections and so on. And I'm wondering uh, how far you really think we can go in understanding human biology in having uh, this parts list. So I think we can go a long ways, but we need to be very thoughtful about the limits of that and not get carried away uh, with how clever we are in understanding the genome and how that's going to reveal wisdom about lots of other things where the genome may be playing a role, but other things are really critical. You mentioned the brain. It's clear that the genome plays a rather central role in getting that all organized during development, but it's also very clear that those neuronal connections are profoundly influenced by things that happen in the environment, particularly in early infancy. We understand that now at least some level. 
But we also know identical twins, nature's experiment to tell us whether DNA is everything. Uh, if you look at them carefully, we'll tell you that it certainly isn't. If you get to know a pair of identical twins who have exactly the same genome, uh, they're different people, and sometimes rather strikingly so, even though they're also rather strikingly similar in certain other uh, ways. And we should constantly remember that and not slip into a new kind of genetic determinism fueled by uh, the excitement of uh, the opportunity that we now have in unraveling the genome. The same can be said of medical illnesses. While understanding those genetic contributions to disease is going to be a critical way to shine light uh, on areas that have been shrouded in mystery, most of the diseases uh, that you and I will fall ill with will also have environmental contributions. And let's not forget contributions of our own choices and free will. And I don't think free will is going to go out of style just because we've sequenced the genome. Uh, and that's good. Fi fi finally, I would say, uh, for people who believe that human beings are a little bit more than a collection of chemicals, I think this notion that we can reduce ourselves into a mechanical model uh, falls short. It falls short for me. I think there are aspects of being human uh, that we really won't understand uh, from the DNA approach or even from the scientific approach in terms of our spiritual nature. And I hope we will continue to value and cherish that side of ourselves and admit that science has limits. Scientists don't like to say that, but I guess I do. <laughs> Mary Claire King, you, you mentioned uh, our place in evolution, which I think is a, is, a, is a related question very much so, because I think not necessarily the Genome Project, but our ex exploration of genetics over the years has shown that, you know, that human beings are, are genetically remarkably similar to the other great apes and so on. Uh, uh, again, do you think that the, 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 the essence of, of humanness can be found in the genome? What a terrific question. I think we can find in the genome the, the differences, that is the sequence differences between us and chimpanzees that enabled us to become humans and chimpanzees to become chimps. They, after all, have evolved more quickly than we have in the last five million years since we diverged. Savante Pavo's data from uh, Leipzig illustrates that quite clearly. Uh, the, the nature of those changes is particularly remarkable because based on work that now goes back decades, it's very likely that these will not be uh, accumulation of small additive changes in protein encoding genes, but these are much more likely to be changes in the regulation of the timing of expression of genes during development. This is another example to me of how the study of evolution and the study of normal and abnormal human development are going to converge. If we understand uh, normal differences in developmental pathways, that is normal differences in gene expression over the time of development of primates, including ourselves, we will, I think, come to understand both a number of the anomalies of development, both fetal anomalies of development and uh, developmental pathways that go awry in later life associated with schizophrenia and mental, other mental illnesses, and we'll come to understand uh, the evolution of ourselves as a species. So I see these two as being extremely closely related. And the, we talked a lot yesterday about how to figure out what's important when one evaluates differences, whether the differences are between individuals of the same species or between closely related species. Differences nowadays are fairly easy to count. We're good at that. But which ones matter? Which ones are rate-limiting steps to development? And that's an area, a conceptually uh, difficult area for which a lot of additional work is going to be required and for which we need much more contribution by developmental biologists than we've had in the past. So evolution and developmental biology, I think, are going, to be, are going to be wedded from essentially now on out. Um, Dr. Sensheimer, uh, I mentioned when introducing you that you were at Asilomar in 1975, which was sort of in some ways the model for this kind of gathering, scientists saying, we're scientists, but we're also members of the society and we need to sit down and think about what we're doing and, and, and have some sort of, you know, address the broader questions in, in, and hopefully anticipate some of the broader questions that, are, that will arise. Um, it seems like it's a pretty different time now, 26 years later. It, it seems as though, I mean, back in those days, there was a, there was a great deal of concern about what genetic engineering would be, what it, whether it would, uh, you know, cause harmful organisms to spread, whether it would disrupt our environment and so on. 
And uh, some of those issues are still linger, but we don't hear so much of them, particularly in terms of, of this, of what's happening with the genome and the, and the, the information involved in the human genome. It's, it's discussed at some levels, but it's not, I think it's not quite as widely on the public agenda as, uh, as gen genetic engineering was in the days of Asilomar. Um, I, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on this, and is this a good thing, is this a bad thing? Uh, am I right? <laughs> am I wrong? <laughs> Well, thinking back to Asilomar in 1975, some things have changed and some things have not, it seems to me. Uh, the primary concern at Asilomar, although I think it was somewhat misplayed in the press, was the question of the safety of this new genetic engineering technique and the fact that we were going to be able to modify the inheritance of organisms, at that time primarily microorganisms, and whether that could, in unintended ways, produce new pathogens, new entities of, which could be dangerous, and which, for the first time, we were dealing with something we couldn't recall. Should they escape into the environment, there was no way to uh, undo that. With time, most of those concerns were alleviated by more knowledge, more understanding of, of what, we, what was, could be done and what couldn't be done. But it's obvious to me that those concerns have not disappeared. Look at the issue to which you, I believe, uh, referred with regard to genetically engineered crops. Here we are back again, <laughs> worrying about the safety of crops which might be get out into the field and the genes might spread to other plants that we didn't want them to spread to, and whether it's safe to eat them and all that kind of thing. Uh, I, I personally think those concerns are greatly overblown, but nevertheless they are in the public mind uh, very large. Another difference would be, in those days we were all, quote, uh, Simon Pure, unquote, academics. <laughs> And we had no ax to grind, really, other than this particular issue of doing our own research and whether it was safe to do it. You could not have a Selimar today. So much of the research is being done in the biotech industry. And there would be issues of proprietary information. There would be issues of patents. There would be questions in, which have come up in the genetically engineered food issue of taint, if you will, by the profit motive skewing the, re the apparent uh, arguments. So I think that it was a different era, and one of the ways in which it is very different is in fact the introduction, for better or worse, of private industry into the area of biology. Yeah. Do you think we need an asilomar like discussion of genomics, or is, or is it, uh, or the issues, uh, do they not rise to that sort of standard? Well, you, you perhaps don't know, we did have a meeting at Asilomar a little over a year ago. It was, it was sort of the 25th anniversary <laughs> of the first one, to discuss in just the question you're raising, uh, would it be worthwhile to have another Asilomar to discuss some of the issues in connection with genomics and, and the re related topics. And the conclusion was you couldn't do it for the reasons that I mm. specified. I see. It would not be possible today. That's interesting. Gene Myers, um, I'm interested in, uh, in your perspective on this. You are somebody who has worked in academia and in the, in the private sector as well. Should we be worried about uh, biology sort of becoming a private enterprise, is it, I'm not even sure what analogy to use. I mean, you can think of the great physics discoveries that led to, uh, you know, desktop printers and things like this that we all take for granted and don't blink an eye at. On the other hand, you can also say, uh, as others do, that uh, this is an example of information that we should all have available to everyone being, uh, being sequestered by people who uh, have a profit motive and who may not want to share it with us. We're, how, how worried should we be about this trend of biology becoming a business? Um, uh, well, 
I mean, I don't think it's too big of a, of a problem in the sense that, that as the technology moves forward, the ability to, to uh, uh, produce this information um, will become increasingly easier um, to the point where economically um, everyone will be able to get at it. Um, I think that uh, um, there may be a, a time element in the sense that um, um, you know, some of these things are, are currently uh, done only at great cost. Um, and so the parties that are doing it want to have some kind of advantage on that, on the information, at least for a, a time period. Um, I don't think this situation is, for example, unique to biology. For example, in, in my own discipline, computer science, um, in the early days it was very easy to do operating systems research to think about how to build programs that managed resources on computers. Um, today, frankly, the only places that have the resources to do true operating systems research are, you know, Microsoft and DEC and a few big, big uh, uh, conglomerates. And if you want to build an OS, that's where you go. Um, you know, I, I, I think that um, there are, you know, there are, there, you know, having been on both sides of this, there are pluses and minuses um, um, both ways in terms of, you know, being an academician and being a... Um, um, being in a, in, a, in a private sector concern. Um, one of the things that I loved about being an academician and still love about being an academician is I had complete freedom to think about whatever I wanted to, whenever I wanted to think about it, okay? And that's great, okay? Um, and that's what, that's what fundamental discovery is about, okay? And that's, I think, the fundamental role of an academician is to create new techniques, to create new ideas, and to live in that world. Um, and, and I love that world. Um, you know, in, in, a, in a corporate domain, the thing that was nice um, about Solera is, is when I was at Solera was, is, is that I had the resources to do what I needed to get done. It was, you know, like when I went and said, I need $6 million for computers, okay? N nobody batted an eyelid, all right? Um, okay? <laughs> And uh, if I had gone to my uh, chancellor and asked for that, I think I <laughs> would have gotten a different <laughs> response. Okay, so, I mean, it's, it's you know, so there, there are, but, but, but on the other hand, I mean, you know, I, I basically, I've spent the last three years of my life building software for doing assembly of human genomes and things that are specifically relevant to the company. Um, so the great thing about being in, in the corporate world is, is that while you have tremendous resources to do whatever it is that is deemed to be appropriate to the commercial enterprise, um, you are constrained to that, to that enterprise. Um, so I think that there's, I, I don't think that this is a kind of a either or, exclusive or situation. I mean, I think that both communities are extremely important and the interchange between them is important. I mean, I think where sometimes it gets a little bumpy is this in the transition where things, new ideas and novel technologies get to the point where all of a sudden you're ready to do a big scale up. And then there's kind of the interesting question, should it be done, you know, should it be done in the private or should it be done in the, in the, public, in the public domain? I certainly think that, that um, all of this information should be in the public and, ulti and ultimately I believe that it will be because um, if, you, if you follow the internet world at all, people talk about the time value of information. 50 years ago, if you wanted to get the Encyclopedia Britannica, you had to pay big money for it, okay? Today, you can get it on a CD for, you know, it, it comes with your copy of Windows NT, right? Um, okay, I think the same thing will happen to this information, okay? At some point, just having the human genome sequence won't be of any particular value. It will have lost its value through time. Okay, in terms of its individual resource, the, the value curve will be way out there in terms of the interpretation of that information, and that wave is going to continue to move. So I think for people to think that the information is going to be locked up and will never see the light of day, that that's completely wrong. So I'm, I'm not too worried about this issue for, for that reason, um, in the sense that I think that ultimately um, all the information that, that, that people will require to do fundamental research will be out. And I really think that, that um, and I'm really looking forward to in this next period that I'm talking about, um, I really think that a lot of the action is going to come from the people developing the technology, and I expect that to come out of the universities. What about, <coughs> pardon me, what about Dr. Sitzheimer's uh, conclusion from Asilomar last year that essentially you can't do another Asilomar because there's so much, so much of this information is now, at least temporarily, uh, proprietary. This may not apply as much to Solera, I appreciate, as it, as it may to other biotechnology companies. Uh, but, I mean, is this, uh, is, it, is it stopping the flow of, of scientific ideas and uh, not necessarily the raw data, but sort of the, the bigger questions? Uh, or can you really answer those bigger questions if you don't really know what's going on behind closed doors at, uh, at private corporations? Well, 
I, I mean, I'm not exactly sure how to answer the question in the sense that I think there are always closed doors. I mean, I think there are things probably going on in other countries that we don't know about and never will know about. And so I, 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 don't, I don't quite understand the, the issue in the mm -hmm. sense that... Mm -hmm. Dr. Collins, do you have thoughts about this? Um, I think that for the most part, uh, this interaction uh, between public and private enterprise uh, has been enormously complementary and successful. And if you look at the ways in which new products are developed to benefit the public, it requires vigorous involvement by both sectors, and the best results occur when there's a, a very effective handoff uh, from the point of basic science to a good idea for a clinical effort to the point of, okay, here's a product that needs to be developed. Each of these sectors have strengths in particular areas and weaknesses in particular areas. I think the conflicts that have been apparent are often sort of at the boundary and particularly in areas where you're talking about information that might be considered competitive, but it might be considered pre-competitive, where everybody is going to want to have that information, and certainly genome sequence is in that boundary. But I actually see this moving forward in a very gratifying way. As Gene has said, the information uh, wants to be public. It just uh, intrinsically uh, wants to be out there in the public domain, and you can't really resist that. And I think it's gratifying to see a number of examples now where pharmaceutical companies have decided that that is what they want too and are willing to put forward large sums of money, the SNPs consortium that I mentioned in my talk being a, a prime example, to make sure that that kind of work gets done and the data gets put in the public domain and they don't even expect to see it a, a second before anybody else does. It is a way of making sure it happens quickly and efficiently and uses the resources of all the folks who contrib contribute. Now would pharmaceutical companies do that for something that was actually part of their business plan uh, that they had as a competitive edge? edge over their uh, colleagues? No way. But they would do it for something that's pre-competitive. And seeing that kind of environment uh, encouragingly come forward, I think, is a very good sign that what some people had perceived as a coming collision uh, is maybe not as bad as it was uh, appearing to be. I do think there's a big issue about intellectual property, uh, particularly when it comes to patents, and particularly when it comes to patents on genes. And this is one that hasn't really uh, played its way out yet. Let me say right up front that I think patenting a gene, if it has a pathway towards a product that has clear utility, uh, can be very beneficial to the public. And if the standard you want to use about gene patenting is, does it or does it not benefit the public, well, there are certainly circumstances where it appears that it does. But if you allow patents to be issued on genes for which the function is only foggily understood, uh, you may actually have just a reverse effect, where that becomes a disincentive to future research and therefore the public is injured as a consequence. And I fear we may have gone a bit too far in that direction by setting the bar of utility uh, somewhat lower uh, than perhaps uh, ideally in some people's views uh, might have been the case. <clears throat> but we're sort of stuck with that. The patent office uh, is issuing patents on genes in large numbers. Uh, we'll have to see what the courts decide to do about that. Fortunately, for most academics, the research exemption says as long as you're not working on something that's going to make a profit, you can ignore the patents anyway. Uh, but of course, you never know when you're working on something where it might go. Ultimately, I think it's the private sector is going to have the toughest time figuring out what to do. Because, you know, the most interesting experiments that you would like to do right now with the genome are not to look at this gene or that gene. It's to look at all the genes. And if a third of the genes have patents issued on them, you're going to have an awful lot of legal work to do, and lawyers are going to get very rich here, and lots of documents will have to be signed before you can do the first experiment. And that could be a significant slowdown in what we all hope to be a big bursting forth here of genomics in this next phase, where the private sector has a critical role to play and may be the most constrained in playing it. Now, maybe there's a way around that with things like patent pools, but they haven't really been worked out yet, and time will tell whether we've dug ourselves into a hole here you know, that we're going to take a long time to climb out of. Mm. I think uh, an interesting analogy might be in the uh, uh, field of microelectronics where there are many, many patents, and I think the solution that they've come to there is that they all just agree to violate one another's patents <laughs> tacitly, and basically it's, it's mutually assured destruction. If you complain that I'm violating this patent of yours, well, you're, you're violating this patent of mine. And, and, uh, and, First uh, person who files a lawsuit and the whole thing collapses. <laughs> that's right. So, so I think that's, that's, that's one 
possible model. The other thing that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing that's a little bit encouraging, uh, although maybe not to business people, but uh, maybe sort of on the broader philosophical point of view, is that patents are temporary. They last 20 years. Uh, so uh, 20 years seems like a long time if you're a business person, but I or mean, a patient. Or a patient. Yeah. Yes, that's true. But uh, in in the considering how long. Uh, I mean, you, you laid out a 30-year schedule of things where things were just starting to get rolling in, in 2030. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's, it's uh, being Pollyannish to think that maybe it's a good thing that everyone's filed all their patents before they know what they're used for, and by the time we figure it out, all the patents will be expired and we can move <laughs> along. But, um, what, uh, but um, that, what, what sort of things I would like to ask each of you, what on the horizon bother you most, concern you most about how this might get misused and abused, um, this information, uh, the way things are going uh, as, as everything is unfolding here? Obviously, we heard a lot of a wonderful potential uh, in Dr. Collins' talk, but also uh, flags of caution. And Mary Claire King, maybe I could start with you. Where, where would you wave the largest caution flag? Mm. Good question. Let me, let me say two very different kinds of things. One, in a very parochial way as a, as a geneticist, to follow up on something Francis was saying, um, I have an enormous amount of trouble with the idea of patenting genes. Um, it, it seems to me that patenting a gene is roughly equivalent to patenting your left thumb. Um, it's a natural product. It uh, is virtually the same in all individuals. I have absolutely no problem with patenting therapeutic compounds, but I would put the, the line at a very different place, or a, a very different place than the patent office now puts it, and even a different place than the Collins Varmus uh, suggestion of several months ago. That is, that there must not only be um, a biological function defined for the gene, but there must be a, a physical substantive product at hand which the uh, finding of this gene uh, has led to that itself has some therapeutic diagnostic or other um, pharmacologically useful consequence. Uh, it's, it's my experience as somebody who goes about finding genes and figuring out how they interact with each other that nowadays when I find that uh, I find a gene which is involved in a, a, a bit of, of human pathology that formerly this sequence had no known involvement with, I find more often than not that that gene has already been patented multiple times, and presumably and by different by different outfits. It would be a little tag here patented by one outfit, a little tag here patented by another outfit, a little tag here patented by another outfit. Meanwhile, the whole sequence is lying in front of me, and it turns out that mutations in it are responsible for inherited deafness. And and this is silly. I mean, this is just silly. I mean, nobody has previously patented this bit of DNA for any pathology at all. It's just been patented because it was picked up as tags in a series of different places. And I think we are headed toward the courts having to figure this out, and this is an unfortunate role for the courts to have to take on. Right. And one thing about gene patents is if, if a gene is patented for any purpose, if you can have any, if you can say it's useful for anything more than landfill, for example, uh, exactly. then uh, any, any use that you find for it actually would be yeah. covered. So it's not just, so there's a, there's yeah. a in, the, in the world of patents, there's a, uh, the concept of patenting a use and or patenting the whole uh, thing and the, and the whole thing is being patented along. It, it's a yeah. mess. Yeah. It's a mess. And it does impact our research and it does impact it in negative ways. Um, it, do I stop? Of course not. Do I worry about it? Yeah. Um, the, a, a nice counterexample is a gene which is known to any of you who work in molecular biology and that's P53. P53 is probably the most important gene in, in terms of its role in, in uh, cancer. That gene was not patented by Arne Levine when he first characterized it, and I wouldn't say that work on P53 or on products derived from P53 has been slowed at all by the absence of a patent. I think it's been just hunky-dory. So one thing that concerns me parochially as a professional is the patent issue. As a citizen, I think what concerns me is that we will have to, with the, with the uh, availability of the genome and, and our interest, including very much my own, in understanding human variation, we will have to revisit the, the issue that comes up in every generation, and that is genetic determinism and the concept of race. Uh, we've been through it on this campus and in this system um, a couple of times in my life in the UC system since the mid-60s, and I think we'll probably have to go through it again. Um, 
I think this time, more than ever before, we have very strong tools available to us to debunk both determinism in general and racism as, as one manifestation of determinism in particular. But uh, the, the kind of work that I've been doing internationally for uh, human rights efforts is, has thrown me into uh, the maelstrom of the new nationalistic movements, which are really quite extraordinary in some of the nonsensical uses that are made of uh, alleged um, distinctiveness of ancestries at the genetic level by a whole lot of thugs involved in those movements, are ones that we will be forced as um, citizens of the world to deal with. So I think educating our kids and our young adults and ourselves so that we're in a position to be able to deal with with that kind of threat, using the tools that we know about, uh, is to me one of the big concerns. Hmm. Thank you. Gene Myers? Um, I also would agree that the utility bar on patents is way too low, and uh, I think the patent office has made a mistake um, in the sense that uh, um, the conditions for patent are, are, are too easy. Um, and I actually agree with what Mary Claire says. Um, the one exception would be that if you find a protein that in and of itself is a drug, a, a so-called protein therapeutic, then you should be able to patent that use of the protein as a, as a drug. But otherwise, I, I agree. I think it's an obstacle that the, that the real goal is to be able to patent a, 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 a particular protein because it might be a target for something that you don't know yet. Um, 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 is, is not appropriate. Um, uh, in terms of um, um, uh, issues to be worried about, I mean, I think that the most pressing one is the, uh, the issue of um, genetic discrimination. Um, it, it's very clear that the, one of the first benefits and, and outcomes of the genomic pro Genome Project will be an acceleration in our understanding of genetic variation and how it causes uh, diseases and, and our ability to genotype people and to be able to screen them and understand what their prevalences or their probabilities are for particular conditions. And so um, I think that since that's coming online first, that we really need to address the ethical and uh, social issues around that, that, that first. And I guess just to, um, um, to, to follow up on another thing that uh, Mary Claire said about, um, uh, about uh, uh, racism is, is that uh, an interesting fact for you all is, is that um, if I take um, um, two individuals from the same race, and two individuals from, a sep from separate races, that it's very likely that the um, two individuals from the separate races will have fewer differences, genetic differences between them, than the ones that are inside the same racial pool. So what does that say about race? All right. In terms of genetic discrimination, uh, every year Congress, uh, or no, members of Congress, uh, trot up legislation to deal with this in one form or another. My impression this year is that, uh, well, there le there's legislation on the table once again. Do you see more uh, likelihood that they will actually see some action this year in, in the Congress? Well, I hope so. <laughs> this is the first year where there have been meaningful hearings on specific pieces of legislation, two hearings in the Senate, three in the House. Uh, the President uh, came out in June in his radio address endorsing the need for legislation uh, to prevent genetic discrimination. The momentum has been, I think, greatly assisted by the sense the public has that, gosh, you know, the genome is not some future thing. It's really roaring along. This recent case of the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Railroad, uh, who were testing their employees without their knowledge uh, for a rare genetic condition that might have explained their carpal tunnel syndrome, and we're clearly aiming, therefore, to take away the company's responsibility for covering their medical expenses or maybe to just fire them so that they wouldn't have to cover them later. That was quite an eye-opener. Here is an example of the most sort of egregious misuse of genetic information, which was both scientifically seriously flawed and ethically uh, flawed even more so. And it happened uh, to real people uh, who went through a great deal of distress as a result. So the wake-up calls have been coming on an even increasing basis, and I think people are beginning to catch on that maybe we ought to do something about this before hundreds of thousands of people have been injured. But of course, that is a challenge. Uh, in general, our policy process doesn't do a very good job of prevention. Uh, we react to crises and catastrophes. We shouldn't have to wait this time. We can see the train coming down the track, and we ought to just get ourselves ready for that instead of standing in the tracks and waiting to get whacked. That's a, a, a Burlington Northern train, are we talking about? The Burlington Northern train is coming <laughs> Um Dr. Sinsheimer, did you? Uh, I, I'd ask a, a question that's floated around the table. Let me turn it to you, which is what of, of the potential problems confronting us, what concern you, concerns you most here? 
Well, I could give you a long list, but uh, Dr. Collins referred to, I think he put it off to 2030, the question of genetic enhancement and obviously the problems that that could give rise to, not merely uh, as a question of safety or of designing your own future, but the potential for developing different caste systems and among humans and so on. But what strikes me is that well before that, we will have the possibilities based on the information coming out of these programs for uh, drug enhancement. We already have a, a small number of those which are used by athletes and so on. But it seems to me that the, uh, with increased biological knowledge, a much greater variety of drugs, more effective drugs, could be developed, both for, um, if you will, physical or physiological enhancement, or also for uh, mental entertainment, shall we say? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think with that, we have a hard enough time with the, the limited, dealing with the limited number that are currently available, and how to deal with a much larger and probably more potent variety might become a major problem. Hmm. Um, I should have uh, looked at my watch a few minutes ago because I should have uh, asked people if they had questions. This is the time to, uh, to uh, ask them. We have a microphone down here, a microphone down here, and a microphone uh, up in the ether someplace for the uh, folks at the, uh, uh, up the hill at the remote site. So uh, I will take questions from all three microphones. Uh, and I would, I'll start over here. Could I ask uh, people to introduce themselves before they ask a question, please? My name is Stanley Flatte. I'm a professor here at Santa Cruz in physics. And my question is about technology. I uh, think that the educated public has a very good idea about what, the, uh, the, what DNA looks like, it's, that it's a double helix. They understand what the genetic code is. It's been explained pretty clearly. I think on the other end, once you're given the genetic code, People can understand what it means to write a computer program. They couldn't do it themselves, but they understand more or less what the idea might be. But I don't think we have a picture at all in our minds of what these machines were that, that allowed this incredible expansion in the capability of, of sequencing by factors of what, what is the number, 10,000 in just two or three years? What do those machines actually do? Thank you. <laughs> G. Myers. Do I, do I get that one? Um. And, and Wes Leroy is here and wants to answer this. Is Lee out there? <laughs> yeah, Lee probably could give a, a much better answer. But um, um, basically what, what happens is it, using a series of robots, we do a series of chemical reactions that um, basically prepare the DNA um, for reading on these machines and the, the, the preparation produces basically a ladder. It separates, you know, 600 bases of the DNA into a, a ladder of 600, uh, 600 different lengths that's sitting there in the test tube. This, this plate is put on the machine and then the, the, the beauty of the machine is, is that it, it basically takes it from there. It loads itself and actually does the, um, the, the reading reaction. And the reading reaction involves separating the molecules in, um, in, a, in, a, in a gel electrophoretic tube and, uh, and reading and detecting the molecules when they come out the other end of the tube with a laser and a photo detector. Okay, that, that was my best shot. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I must say that I, I've seen some of these, including at Solera, and uh, they don't make very exciting radio because they look, you look at this box. <laughs> It's a, it's a $300,000 machine about the size of that lectern over there, and all it is is it looks like a jukebox without any stuff in it, uh, with the actual physical appearance. But I gather uh, it's, I think, equally important is the computing power behind it. It's not just getting the, getting the DNA read, but then figuring out how to reassemble something as, as big as, as this. And I think that 
you should, I think that deserves yeah, a mention. I, mean, I think there were several issues faced by, by all of the groups, which was, which was getting the robotics in place to do these reactions efficiently. I mean, that was, that was a big issue, was figuring out how to, how to do these things that you traditionally do with lots of hands. And in fact, I mean, this is one of really, I think, the big changes is that there are now robots that do a lot of the pipetting and stuff. And if, you, if a particular process is important enough to you, you can actually develop an automated pipeline. Um, uh, where uh, uh, tremendous numbers of these reactions are done. So basically getting those, that, those pipelines set up was one of the big issues. The other one was really actually running those machines at scale day in and day out, 24 by 7. And then the other one was dealing with the informatics. I mean, what do you do when you've got, you know, 200 million base pairs coming at you every day? And there, there's only 87,000 seconds in a day, by the way, if you want to <laughs> think about it that way. That was one of the big things we thought about a lot at Solera. 80, <laughs> I, th I actually do think that this relates to the broader social issues we were talking about a little bit, which is it is so hard to conceive 3.1 billion bases of DNA. I mean, what's a billion anything anyway? And then there are these machines humming around that are doing this essentially magic. I mean, it does make it hard to just to, to grab it. We aren't dealing with, uh, with you know, wampum or whatever. It's, uh, it, is, it is, you know, beyond comprehension in... in, in in a lot of ways. If we started reading the sequence of the DNA at this symposium, which seems like a nice idea, you know, it's a very significant time in history. I'd assign uh, various chromosomes to various people. We'd all agree to stay here all night to get the job done and have the experience of saying, for the first time, people sat in an auditorium and read the sequence. If we read at a rate of ACGTTG, something like that, and people agreed to let somebody speak before they did, we'd all be here for 32 years. <laughs> Without hours. doing it 10x, right? So <laughs> just once, not 10x. Just, just once. <laughs> Question from this microphone. Hi, I'm Neil Schaefer. I'm a lecturer here at UCSC. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that the Solera and government sequencing projects were each based on the genetic sequences of about 10 people. I have three short questions. One, what were the exact number of people used? Two, given these small numbers, how can we be so sure that what was sequenced really is the human genome in an exact and universal sense? And three, to what degree did the two groups of people used represent the ethnic t diversity of the world as a whole? Thank you. So this, this is a question related to how many people were sequenced, how many, how many people contributed DNA for the process. Uh, I'll ask people on e both ends of the table to answer. Uh. So for the public effort, we actually were concerned that the people whose sequence was determined uh, not be uh, known individuals because there's some risk you know, that this might be used against them. Would you want it to be your sequence up there on the internet for everybody to look at? Some people would say no. Um, and again, there is no reference human genome sequence. There is no right answer here. Uh, we all differ and so it's rather uh, random and not terribly important actually which sequence one starts with as long as what you're talking about is trying to get that 99.9% .9 where we are all similar. It matters a lot what you do about looking at the 0.1% where we're different. Uh, the public project actually had two different arms of the effort. The sequencing part focused on the DNA of about a dozen people. These were people who came forward and answered a newspaper ad, uh, one in California and one in the Northeast. Uh, we do not know exactly which of those people had their DNA used because after getting blood samples from a hundred such volunteers, we tore off all the labels and we picked a subset of them without knowing which ones they were intentionally uh, so that there was even a greater, uh, like, a greater certainty that no one would be able to figure out whose sequence it is. So they don't know for sure whether they got used or not. There was ethnic diversity in those donors, but I don't know which sample is which in the donors that were used. Now when it comes to studying variation, the SNPs that I was talking about, for that purpose, NIH assembled a panel of 450 DNA samples. They are roughly evenly divided between people whose ancestry was Asia, Africa, Europe, or the Americas before colonization. Those samples are now being used by many, many groups uh, to get this catalog of human variation built. And I think they have a pretty good chance, therefore, of representing variation in a worldwide basis and not focused on one particular group, although there is no perfect set of samples for that either. It's a reasonable first approximation. So while this is not a perfect way to do things, it was sort of the best way we could come up with. And actually, I think Gene will tell you Solera's approach was not drastically different. 
Um, no, well, we, uh, I guess the one difference is, is that we did, we did record the uh, self-declared ethnicity of the, uh, uh, of the donors, but we had, again, the same kind of a process. We had an institutional review board that was duly constituted. We collected many, many samples from individuals, um, um, and, uh, and, and they were blindly selected. Um, we ended up doing two males, three females, um, um, a variety of uh, ethnicities. Um, the ethnicities are important um, in the sense that um, it, it is the case there are correlations with medical um, um, prognoses and, and tendencies, and so it's useful to actually have that information if you're interested in, in human medicine, and so we, we retained it for that reason. But again, the, the race was self-declared. The individuals declared what their race was. Um, and uh, uh, um, we did, we did uh, I guess I said we did five individuals. And, and again, it, it is the case that, that there is no one single human genome. I mean, the, the, actually the term human genome is really a, the, a description of the set of all of the sequences of all of the people on the planet. Um, that's the human genome. What we did is we developed basically a single reference sequence against which it's now much easier for us to go and determine the genomes of other individuals, the, the, the gene sequences of other individuals. Mary Claire King, do you want to add something? <clears throat> I'd, add, I'd add only one point, and it's just an, an interesting fact that if you think about will come to your minds also and is implicit in what each of these guys are saying, and that is that the variation which is shared across people of, regardless of the particular continent w with which they most recently identify uh, is, are the common variants. What one needs to know very precise ancestry to know, including, of course, ideally one's immediate family ancestry, uh, are rare variants. Rare in genetics generally, in all species, generally means more recent, and common generally means deeper. So depending, it, like everything else, it, it depends on the hypothesis that one has. If one has a hypothesis that there is a particular rare variant which is of enormous importance for a trait of interest, like say, you know, skin color, uh, one then focuses on individuals whose ancestries differ by continent of origin that will be correlated with skin color. So it's all a matter of the nature of the hypothesis for the, for the basic sequencing of the human genome, since, as Francis pointed out, 99.9% uh, .9 of the variation is shared across individuals of, regardless of continental ancestry, it truly didn't matter a whole lot. Now what we have to do is sort out the individual bits that we care about. Thank you. Um, well, we will try to take a question from the other auditorium, which should, is, supposed to, is supposed to come in through our loudspeaker. So, hello, other auditorium. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mary Elizabeth, and I'm from Sacramento, California. And I had two questions regarding some ethical concerns that I have. One, is there any professional scientific organizations that are concerned with ethical questions, such as creating and destroying life for harvesting cells? My second question is if any of you would expand on some of the ethical review processes that are currently in place, both at the public and private level, when considering universities which are accepting private funds. Thank you. Thank you. That was a little bit tough to understand uh, in terms of audio quality, but did you, did you get it? Francis I got Collins? the first question. I didn't get the second. Uh, the first question, I believe, was whether there are professional organizations of scientists who are interested in bioethics issues. And there certainly are. Uh, in fact, bioethics has become a very rapidly growing field, in part because there are a lot of dilemmas now and a lot of support for people who want to study them. And so, yes, uh, there are bioethics associations of international, national, and local sorts. Uh, they are populated not only by scientists, but by people whose background is in theology or social science or ethics. And they are very interesting melting pots of ideas. If you have a chance to go to one of those, I would, I would recommend it. It's a very vigorous field. There don't seem to be uh, any particular circumstances where there's only one revealed way uh, to look at a difficult issue. Uh, people uh, diverge a lot, which is either a blessing or a curse. If you want a bioethicist to back up your opinion, just do a little shopping and you can probably find one. Uh, but I think it has been a very positive development in the field that this whole area has grown so uh, rapidly and well. And I'm sorry I couldn't hear the second question well enough. We, we think the second question pertains to uh, limits of uh, research, privately funded research at public institutions. And, and is, is that what you understood, Mary Claire? That's what I understood. Is that what you meant to ask, questioner? It's the ethical review board. How are they constituted? Oh, was that the question? Oh, thank Thanks. You. you guys can probably understand better than we can. Um, any of us who carry out research involving people, as I do, uh, at a 
at an academic institution must, before that research begins, have that research reviewed by what's called an institutional review board. Internationally, these are called Helsinki committees. Uh, the, the standards that are used are internationally remarkably uniform, and in fact, one of the fascinating parts of my life in the last several years has been to be able to be on um, institutional review boards in a variety of cultures. One thing that geneticists share is a sense of what makes sense and what doesn't in terms of work with, with human subjects, and we are probably more conservative than many of our colleagues even in social science about this. Um, these institutional review boards are specific to the institution, but as I've inferred, often have exchanges back and forth among institutions and are made up of people from the professions of interest, medical professions primarily, but also of people from social science, uh, people from humanities, and people from social service organizations, social welfare, the ministry, and so on. Uh, one's research must be reviewed by this board before one can begin it, regardless of whether it is funded or not, and if it's funded, regardless of the source of funding. It's the nature of the responsibility of the institution to, to do that review. The, getting this done well is an enormous amount of effort, which is itself badly underfunded. Um, the amount of staff time that's required to do this properly, considering the, the huge increase in the amount of research in identifying new genes and in predictive testing that could be undertaken by many groups now, is just, it's, it's increased probably two orders of magnitude in the last five years. It's just gone up very fast. And almost none of the pu public institutions, and I don't know about the private ones as well, but I suspect it's true there as well, have the resources to hand to be able to handle this well. So at that level, it's frustrating. It's just slow. Um, on the other hand, the upside for us of, as investigators is that one consequence of this very um, extensive long-term review before you can start is that when you do start, your work is quite well known by uh, colleagues at your institution beyond your immediate field. And if there are difficulties, and every once in a while there are, every once in a while a particular patient will be upset and will, one often believes, of course, erroneously um, impute bad motives to one. One has a base of colleagues locally who can say, wait a minute, I do know about that research. Um, I will speak up for you. And furthermore, of course, your institution takes on the liability. So it's part of what we have been um, brought up in in our generation of science, and it's definitely here to stay, and it needs more funding from the state, both in Washington and here, than it's currently got. Thank you. I'll take a question from over here. My name is Larry Tebow. I teach biology at Santa Cruz High School. Um, I have a question about the tension that exists between understanding how things, how the whole um, is functions versus the parts, and I'd like to preface it. Um, and this is not in any way to diminish what I think is a tremendous potential of understanding the, knowing what the genome is. I grew up with four sisters and a brother who had cystic fibrosis and lived and saw them live and die. And so I can relate very well to the kind of research that Dr. Collins has done and um, his reference to the genetic role versus the environmental role. I've also s traveled extensively in Latin America and spent a lot of time in Mexico with poor people and seeing the kind of health problems people have there due to environmental factors that are very simple and obvious, like lack of potable water, refrigeration, sanitation. Um, I also studied ecology and um, am aware of the role that computers play in trying to understand complex systems. And finally, I also participated in research related to cancer caused by, possibly caused by radon, but in which diesel smoke was used as a vector and to me, it seemed obvious that diesel smoke represented a bigger risk factor than the radon itself did, or it's, it still seems to me that that's the case. Um, and the analogy, I'm, it's not a very good analogy perhaps, but the one I'm led to think of is if you're thinking about safety and preserving lives and so forth, you could focus on designing car bodies to be safe with seat belts and airbags. Um, but you might also look at things like mass transit and urban design and pedestrian safety and so forth. And I'm, the concern I have is I studied biology at UCSC as this transition was occurring from sort of the skin out organismal biology towards blender biology. And um, <laughs> both those parts are important. And I'm wondering, it's, it seems to me it's often much easier to understand how any individual part works, much easier to understand that than to put it all together. And I was thinking about your decision to disappear and go to Nigeria and work in a village to provide health care and 
Richard Harris's comment about the connections between neurons, which are much harder to, to sort of link to the genetic basis. And my, my question is the following. Despite, despite the potential, are any of you concerned that the shift in science, in biology in particular, might be away from looking at the environment and ecosystems and the role hormones are playing in the environment and diversity of, or the variance in, in genetic makeup yeah. towards more profit oriented parts research, um, in particular in the universities. Yeah, this, this is a somewhat arcane question because it really comes down to what sort of support there is for biology across the fields of biology. And I, because, uh, and I think the question is really whether there's enough support where too much money goes to this versus other fields of biology, I guess. And I'm not sure any of us is exactly in a position to tackle that, but uh, I'll make Francis try. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a great question. And I think there is an assumption in your question that if one decides to study the parts, uh, to study the genome, that that means that the environment is going to be uh, by necessity neglected. I would hope that's not the case. Uh, certainly over and over again as we study common diseases where we know both genes and environment are playing a role, I believe that by studying the genetic contributions, we may well get insights to the environmental part that we wouldn't have gotten by just zeroing in on that and ignoring heredity. Because an environment that may be perfectly safe for one person may be quite risky for another. We already have examples of that that are pretty well worked out. Some of my closest colleagues at NIH are in the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, which is the part of NIH that really studies environmental risk factors. And we're constantly plotting ways to make sure that as we do these family studies to try to identify well, what are the hereditary factors in diabetes or cancer? We're also coming up with creative ideas about how to collect environmental information that might allow us uh, to, to figure out these interactions in ways we couldn't have before. I believe that's part of our mission, and I think we would be short-sighted uh, if we were to imagine, and it feeds into this same mistake called genetic determinism, that just by studying DNA, it'll all make sense. It won't unless we have a more holistic view of human health, as your question proposes, we're going to miss a lot of opportunities. And I think most scientists somewhere deep down understand that. It is a little compelling right now because the genome is such hot stuff and there's so much that you can do that you couldn't have done before, uh, perhaps transiently in some instances to forget that. But I think in the long run, we will not forget that. We will figure out how to do in a complementary way the best genetic research and the best environmental research. Well, I would just add that what's already been mentioned in a way that one's individual genetic characteristics influence one's reaction in to environmental effect, uh, issues, or environmental circumstances. And knowledge then of one's individual genome would help one to better adapt to whatever environmental concerns are present at that time. Thank you. I'll take a question from the left. My name is Rebecca Brasla. I'm a chemistry professor here at UC Santa Cruz. And um, I think that scientists histor historically have not been very successful at communicating to the public what we do and how what we do can either benefit or not benefit the public. And as one has seen from the backlash to the genetically modified or, uh, foods in Europe and what's growing here, at least in Santa Cruz, but I think also um, in the United States, um, the public is very, excuse me, very concerned about these things. And aside, so my question is, aside from general, increasing general science education, what particular programs or strategies can one envision to help the public make educated choices about the ethical questions that we're going to be facing? So we should be sure that people like Richard Harris, uh, who are the mouthpiece for science to lots of the public, uh, are fully cognizant of the science and its consequences. And Richard is a model of somebody who does that extremely well. And fortunately, there are quite a number, but there are also some who get it wrong. And the scientists sometimes help them get it wrong by getting perhaps a little too excited about their finding and placing it as though it had a larger context than perhaps it deserves. But I think public education about science 
is a critical part of our future, and I, I guess I try to convey that in the sense that we're going to have all these dilemmas, and if we don't have informed people participating in the resolution, it's just going to go straight south. So we really have to make that a priority, much more than scientists have. I think in the past, it was perfectly acceptable for a scientist to say, that's somebody else's problem. I'm in the lab. Leave me alone. <laughs> I don't think we can do that anymore as scientists. I think we have a shared obligation to explain what we do, why it matters, what the possible pitfalls are. And I think we need to give scientists opportunities to put that desire into action. In genetics, uh, we recently put out a uh, educational kit, the Genome Institute did, which has a video and an interactive CD-ROM and some other materials in it. And we've now sent out 60,000 of those in the last six months, uh, and I hope is, is now in the hands of most high school biology teachers in the country and a lot of other people as well. We asked scientists who are members of the American Society of Human Genetics if they would be willing to serve as ambassadors of information in their local school systems uh, using this kit as sort of a uh, breaking of the ice or a foot in the door. And hundreds of them responded, yes, they would love to. Nobody sort of gave them a suggestion of how to do this. And that is getting underway, I think, now in a significant uh, uh, fashion. And that is just one example. We've got to be really creative here, though. It's not the tradition, I think, for scientists to take this upon themselves. A lot of scientists feel pretty uncomfortable in the role, particularly if what they work on uh, feels like it's hard to explain uh, to the average member of the public. But you know, science is so compelling. If one strips away the details, sort of goes to the principles, remembers why it is that we all got excited about being in this field in the first place, and convey a little bit of that passion, as well as the sense of responsibility, that kind of a dialogue goes a long way to starting a person into a pathway who's listening to this of wanting to stay informed, wanting to get involved. Very quick. I'd like to just give one example from my experience in Washington. For me, one of the greatest pleasures in the last five years that I've been in Washington has been working with a program that Lee Hood began a couple of years before I arrived that is a, a partnership between faculty and in genomics at the university and public school teachers of, of youngsters, both um, elementary, middle school, and high school. Uh, the, it's, the administration, as you might imagine, is Byzantine, but as I understand it, I, I believe that NSF, in fact, is giving grant support to this public school teachers, that is to, uh, for, have I got it right, that the, that the teachers groups or the school districts apply for grants from NSF to fund the release time for the teachers, the, resource, the resources for the teachers, and we're talking, you know, like 23 cents an hour here. I mean, this is not big money. Uh, and on the other hand, Lee, his wife, Valerie Hogan, and, and a number of their colleagues mobilize the scientists from the university to actually go into the schools. Now, people of my age are not the best people to actually put into the schools. We're great at working with the teachers, but the best people to have in the classrooms are our graduate students and postdocs. And this kind of alliance where you, where you take advantage of the labor from the university, from the, from the graduate students on through the faculty in various ways, and then, you, and then you seize the opportunity to bring additional money from NSF into the public sector educational process works very well. It's dynamic, just like everything else in genomics, it has to change every year. And it's an enormously um, labor-intensive thing to do. But if you, can, if you can put people into spots where they can do what they already do well, it's proven to be fruitful. Um, th there's no magic bullet here. I mean, everything is, of course, very, very incremental. But that's one process in, in the Puget Sound area that, in my experience, has been extremely successful. Thank you. Um, let's take another question from the uh, other auditorium. And could I please ask you to speak up because we do have trouble hearing you up here. Thank you. Hey, hello. Am I on? Okay. I'm Joe Papendick. I'm a recent graduate of UCSD. And I guess my question really parallels the one two before about the connection between environmental conditions and then genetic solutions to what you call improving conditions of human life or improving humans in this in a medical field of biology. And we have a lot of the disease and deaths in the world are happening due to very simple, preventable um, methods such as treating water and the conditions which we live in of pollution and our cities, which are creating a lot of metal distress and violence. And we focus on these other solutions which seem to be 
more scientifically, passionately driven, um, but in academia. And the connection is kind of strange. Um, and I'm curious if how the profit is influencing this due to the fact that pharmaceutical industries are very profitable, and if not one of the most profitable industries we have. And then, and how come such things as treating water and malnutrition in third world countries are not getting the same sort of research and passion behind them, along with the, dope, lost my question. Uh, you'll get back to improvement of human quality of life. Um, how are we improving quality of life if we're continuing to create solutions to living as breathing, but not living as in the environment of the society we live in, and into the conditions of the urban environment? So. Okay. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I. Um, does it? There are a couple of ways I guess, I guess we could go with it. If I understood the question, it was essentially, again, a question of resources. Are we spending, are we doing the right thing by focusing on treatments, or shouldn't we be spending more of our resources in prevention? Is another, I think, a broader way of saying that, which is a perennial question and a legitimate and important one that I think is one of the most important questions that, that citizens should be asking about uh, in how society spends its money in research. Gene, I wonder if you want to say something about um, a tangential subject, which is uh, uh, one of the g sequencing efforts that's gone on has been sequencing organisms that cause disease. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, huh. that sort of gets at, uh, at least it, it, it bears on this question. Right. I, I, I guess, I mean, I, I preface it by saying that, that I really, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the issues that the, the questioner was asking about, and I, I really hope that we, as a society, pay a lot of attention to those issues. Um, when, at the beginning, when I spoke about being very excited about investigating the cell, I mean, that was my personal interest and passion, so I hope you'll forgive me that, as a mathematician, I, I, I thought that was a problem that, that, that I wanted to think about. I think these other problems of the ecology and these broader problems are also extremely important problems, and I hope that there's lots of effort that goes into these, these problems. I think they're very important as well. Um, at uh, Solera, we, we were recently uh, awarded an, an NIH grant to sequence uh, Anopheles, which is uh, um, the mosquito. Um, the sequence will be freely available. Um, and um, uh, by sequencing um, um, the mosquito, we'll uh, hopefully have a genetic handle on how to go after malaria. Um, so I don't think that it's the case that um, um, there isn't focus on environmental diseases. We're sequencing many um, pathogens and organs that are involved in the propagation of diseases, and I think we'll make great strides in that area in the next few years. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen in, uh, in, in biology in general that uh, uh, we tend to spend more money on our own problems rather than problems that may be inexpensive to solve around the world, but we tend to focus on problems of Americans uh, and uh, that's certainly a fault, not only in science, but I mean in just in broader public policy, because there are clearly, with, a, with, uh, with the right expenditures, there are a lot of solutions already in place, but it's not necess it's, it's a much broader question than just a research question, I think. Yeah, Did we, you want to add something? do a better job of that. I think as America has emerged as the leader of the world, as the soldier of the world, uh, we should also consider ourselves the doctor to the world. And we have done, in general, an inadequate job of that, uh, with some exceptions where people have really plunged in to try to solve problems. And that's partly a research challenge, that we ought to think about research issues outside of our boundaries. And I think we're starting to do that. And what Gene just described, sequencing the mosquito and the malaria genome is about to get completed, uh, is a good example of that kind of effort to do something about a medical problem that doesn't affect very many US citizens. But I think more broadly than that, uh, public health as a major uh, area of need uh, outside the U.S. is not something uh, that we have, as a government necessarily, uh, focused on as much as we might. And I would hope in this uh, time of relative uh, abundance on the part uh, of America that we could think a little bit more creatively about that. Certainly the time I spent in Africa, while it was extremely challenging to treat the medical illnesses that were there if you were lucky enough that somebody came in soon enough and you had access to the resources that were in uh, some of the hospitals you could treat them but you'd go sending them back to the same environment uh, where some other illness or the same one uh, would emerge again because the water wasn't clean or because tuberculosis was rampant in their family and there'd been no effort to try to clear that up and if we really believe uh, that part of our responsibility uh, is to relieve suffering outside of U.S. citizens, uh, it's hard to say that we've done enough uh, in that area, and we really should work harder, and I appreciate the question. Yeah. 
Uh, Dr. Sinsheimer, would you like to have the last word of the evening? <laughs> well, not of the evening, but not just on that particular question. I just wanted to add that one of the aims of the uh, plant genetic engineering is to produce more nutritious crops, such as the golden rice that's been given a lot of publicity, or uh, the efforts that are currently underway to produce virus-resistant cassava plants as are used in Africa, and things like that could almost overnight greatly improve the nutritional situation in some of those countries. Thank you. I'm afraid uh, we have run well over time, and, uh, I, and uh, uh, maybe we'll take one final question here. Since, <laughs> since Dr. Sitzheimer granted you a reprieve since he didn't want the last word. So. <laughs> Okay. Hi, my name is Daniel Hayek. I'm a biology student here. And I was wondering about the panel's thoughts of using genetic data not to treat disease or enhance development, but to slow down or cease aging. Mm. Interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that is a tough one. <laughs> there seems to be some enthusiasm for the topic here. Uh, okay. okay. I'll start from one angle, and then I, I, I think I can guess what Francis is going to say, and this is going to be different. Um, <laughs> after a while, we can all give each other seminars, and we can all you know, take 20 slides from anybody's pot, and you can, sh you can make a story, right? Um, there's some very interesting projects going on in different parts of the world to identify people who have lived very long and very well. Uh, Jim Crow, a geneticist known to many of us, is a participant in this research. He's 85 and going incredibly strong. Um, and one of the, uh, and so the, the hypothesis is that there are genomic uh, specificities, that there will be particular alleles, there will be particular sequences that will characterize these individuals who have had remarkably successful aging. And if we can identify what those are, we can understand the biology of successful aging in the same way that we can understand the biology of disease. Now, there's probably nowhere on earth that one would uh, want to avoid genetic determinism more than this. Obviously, one's environment makes a huge difference. But if one picks individuals from all parts of the world who have successfully aged, one hopes to be able to find some features that they have in common, regardless of where they have lived. So that's one approach to the question, and it's a very exciting one. But that's not necessarily extending life, that's just having life work out better up it's to the living end. Living fabulously until you are 100 and then die as you hang glide out over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Francis Collins. Actually, I'm counting on dying on my motorcycle, but only at age 100, <laughs> thank you. Not I'm sooner than that, if possible. <laughs> It's remarkable when people have studied the aging process in other organisms that are more amenable uh, to easy experimentation that there do seem to be examples of single genes uh, which have the capability, if modified in certain ways, to extend lifespan by perhaps a third, for which for us would mean the average uh, person might live to be 110 and some of us would make it to 130. That would be pretty dramatic, wouldn't it, in terms of the way uh, our whole view of the uh, aging process came about. Will that be true for humans? Will we have a limited number of genes that have that profound an effect on longevity? And in fact, if you try in some way to manipulate those, and I'm not suggesting by modifying the genes, but maybe by that pathway where you come up with some other drug therapy that affects the process in a, in a way that slows down the aging process, what else will it do? Will we all end up being old but not very uh, interesting? Or, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I'd want to sign up for that one. <laughs> so we have a long way to go on this, but there's certainly a vigorous area of research uh, studying the genetics of aging. And it would be surprising to me if in the next 20, 10 or 20 or 30 years we don't uncover some of those influences. Being able to alter the situation I think will take somewhat longer. All right. Thank you. Dr. Sintheimer, did you want to say something? Yeah. Well, no, just sort of a, a fantasy uh, if, if in the next 20 years we are able to extend life by 30 years, as Francis was speculating, and that would give us another 30 years in which they could learn how to extend it another 30 years, <laughs> and then we would be in going on indefinitely. Speaking of going on indefinitely, uh, we had better not uh, be guilty of that here. Did you want to have a final comment on this? Or? Well, I don't know. I think, I mean, I think it goes back to the question that I asked at the very beginning, which is, um, I, I mean, I know personally that, that I've been having a pretty good time, and I'd like to live a long time, and um, I, I imagine that a lot of you would, too. Um, and so the question is, is if we can do it, should we? All right. On that note, I'd like to thank very much the panelists here for their thought-provoking comments.
would, I give talks. And also, thank the audience for being uh, for being attentive and asking good questions as well. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.